Hello and welcome. My name is Luciano Lucas. I'm the Executive Vice President here at DR Vision. And today I have the huge pleasure to be presenting to you Avia 8.5, which is the result of our work uh, the last six months or so since November uh, 2018. This new version of Avia builds on the features that we have been developing and introducing over the last two years. Uh, in these two years, we have developed eight, developed and released eight new versions, and they are all listed here. Uh, you'll notice that some of them, for example, Avia 7 had three versions, was 7, 7.5, and 7.7. So in total, we had eight versions over the two years. And the key functionality we've added is uh, related to handling super large data sets uh, in 2D, 3D, and 3D over time. We've also introduced a number of features that use machine learning uh, or deep learning, depending on the type of application required. And uh, we've introduced also cloud computing through Avia Cloud uh, just last, uh, last uh, uh, November. And now we're introducing a whole new set of tools, part of the uh, our push to help everybody in the life science microscopy community get more out of their uh, microscopy images. So Avia 8.5 includes uh, a number of features. I've alluded to some of them already in the previous slide, but this is the full list uh, of key features. And the first thing I'll be talking about is using deep learning for image deconvolution. After that, I'll be covering the predictive tools of our Neuron Composer, which is a complete platform for uh, recreating or reconstructing 3D neurons in dense, large data sets. I'll also cover our latest efforts to increase uh, the, the size of images that you can interactively render and work with, and a couple of tools for previewing and applying uh, recipes, uh, recipes are the names for our uh, preset workflows for image analysis, using ROIs. We also created a, an additional function for the live import, which allows you to acquire data, and at the same time, Avia is going to be uh, analyzing that data and showing you the results in real time. The pixel classifier has also received some attention. Uh, we've added uh, several uh, performance improvements, but the key functionality is now that you can batch apply a pre-trained pixel classifier. So you can do parameter-free uh, image segmentation now in batch mode as well. In addition, we've added a whole new application for 2D image stitching, which runs inside of Avia, fully integrated. And we've made a number of UI improvements uh, which you will get a chance to see during the, the demonstrations and also one, whenever you decide to, to try Avia for yourself. First, I'll be talking about image deconvolution using deep learning, then predictive neuron tracing, and finally, rendering and analyzing very large data sets. So first of all, we'll talk about AI deconvolution. In this case, is deep learning-powered image deconvolution. Uh, but before we get to that, let's take a step back and look at what the standard uh, standard way of doing deconvolution currently is. So currently, uh, the process is to uh, calculate or measure the point spread function, uh, which is related to the um, error that your system uh, has or introduces when it images an object. So that point spread function together with your object is what creates uh, the images that we see. And typically for wide field microscopy or even confocal microscopy, the type of image that we get has a relatively good XY resolution and worse uh, Z resolution, as you can see on the left-hand side. The right-hand side shows a couple of projections. Uh, this image here is a, a Y Z, and this is XZ, this is XY. So you can see that the 
the image of this case is a small bead. Uh, the image of a small bead is no longer similar to a small bead. It's more similar to an hourglass. Uh, and that's due to the point spread function that is added on to the uh, image as it's being created by an imaging system that has a number of components that will introduce some uh, some distortion to the to the to the image as it's being created. Now, if one can know what the point spread function is, then uh, and and we already have an image, then try to go back to creating a true image of the object, so closer to the ground truth, closer to the object image. Deconvolution using um, a, a measured or um, estimated point spread function is in this presentation called classical deconvolution. And here you can see how classical deconvolution, deconvolution uh, can be used both in uh, wide field or confocal microscopy. If you start here from the left hand side, you can see that uh, wide field for wide field microscopy, the cost of setting up a system like that and running experiments on it is relatively low. It is possible to create images very quickly. Phototoxicity is limited and there are not that many artifacts uh, created by the system. Of course, the 3D images aren't very high quality uh, because you're actually imaging a large volume. There is no pinhole in this kind of system. So you're requiring actually all the fluorescence that comes from the whole volume of the image, of the sample, sorry. Uh, and so the quality of the 3D image is not great. If you do wide field microscopy and then you deconvolve the image, the cost does go up a little bit because you have to buy the software. It takes a little bit longer because you have to actually do the deconvolution, which can be a time consuming process. Phototoxicity stays the same. Artifacts are sometimes introduced by deconvolution, uh, which can be limited uh, or can be controlled to some extent. But the quality overall of the 3D images does go up uh, quite a bit. Now, making a big jump in terms of budget, uh, if you go to use a confocal microscope, you will need quite a few more dollars or euros or yen or whatever currency you're using. Uh, how, and... Uh, it does take a lot longer to image the same type of sample. Um, just the technology is like that because you're scanning uh, scanning a point uh, across a sample. So that, that's uh, pretty time consuming. There's some improvements on this using spinning disk, which is sometimes called multi-point confocal system. And some improvements from other companies, from several companies uh, uh, that uh, try to speed up the process, but it's still... Um, slower than using a wide field system. Phototoxicity is typically higher than using a wide field system and artifacts are uh, in, in line with, with wide field, perhaps a little lower in, in many aspects. The quality of the 3D images is much, much greater than using a wide field system alone or using wide field with deconvolution. But the ultimate quality is achieved if you do confocal microscopy, uh, where you have a pinhole or multiple pinholes, depending on the system, and you do deconvolution on that image. Now, you need the biggest budget, you need to be very patient because you need to acquire the images and then spend time also deconvolving the images, uh, but the quality is the best. So this is a, a quick guide for uh, deconvolution using wide field in confocal microscopy. Uh, but now what I'm particularly interested in and I wanted to discuss here is how does it compare the classical, the classical approach versus the AI or deep learning approach to image deconvolution. So let's go step by step. Uh, if you look at the first item, prior knowledge of the PSF not required. Um, this is not the case for classical deconvolution because PSF is typically required either it needs to be measured which is uh, very time consuming because you have to measure beads uh, in multiple conditions to get uh, a good measurement of, of the real PSF. Or you can estimate that PSF based on uh, all the, the hardware knowledge that you will have. So you'll know what lens you used, what's the refractive index, what the numerical aperture, and so on and so forth. And with all that information, you can estimate the point spread function. Uh, of, uh, of your system. 
For deep learning, that's not required. Uh, the, the model itself, the deep learning model, will learn uh, the point spread function from the data, from the training data directly. So that's a big advantage. Uh, and that's what's mentioned in the second row, actually. So the point spread function is autonomously learned from the data. That's the case for deep learning, not so for the classical approach. Uh, for um, the classical approach, the restoration step itself is an iterative process. Uh, you, that's one of the parameters you can, you can define uh, is how many iterations you want the algorithm to run in order to get to a good result. And so with a classical approach, it is iterative. Uh, with deep learning, the apply part is not iterative. It's a single click, a single process, uh, I should say, single process, not, not an iterative process. However, for um, training a model, uh, in deep learning, obviously, you do need to train a model. And it is an iterative process. Uh, it requires multiple epochs. Uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 epochs is typical, and it can take a few hours to train that model. Whereas with a classical approach, you'd never have a model, basically. You're, each time you start afresh, uh, and you just iteratively apply your algorithm to the data until you get a good result. And you have to do that every single time. Both processes are GPU accelerated, and it can be very fast. However, uh, in terms of restoration quality, um, I think um, deep learning has the, the edge there because it, over time, has the potential to be uh, improved. Whereas with a classical approach, it doesn't really matter how much data you process, the quality is always going to be the same. And it's, it's uh, dependent on that number of iterations and on the setup that you um, created to run the, the deconvolution. Whereas with deep learning, if you have multiple images, you create a model, it will be good. Uh, and later on, you can add more images, training images to that model, and it will be further improved. And later on, you can add again more images to your model, and it will be further improved. And so over time, you can actually make a model that evolves with your work and can both be well, it can either become more general purpose, if that's the intent, or it can become extremely specialized and very, very precise, uh, if that's your intent. In terms of artifact creation and artifact control, uh, both approaches create them. Both approaches create artifacts or have the potential to create artifacts uh, in the restored images. Uh, the classical approach has the advantage in terms of sheer number of known uh, artifacts and, and mechanisms to generate those artifacts and then mechanisms to limit those artifacts. Uh, deep learning uh, deconvolution is a much more recent approach to the problem, so there are less problems reported, uh, and it is relatively easy to, to minimize them just by adding additional training data uh, of high quality, of course. Uh, and by doing that, you can very quickly limit uh, the artifacts that are visible and created by the restoration process itself. In terms of scalability and generalization of the model, the classical approach isn't really meant for that. Um, each time you run the algorithm, you're running it afresh. It has not learned anything uh, from the previous time you ran it. Uh, whereas with uh, the deep learning approach, you have the the option to retrain and do transfer learning on a previously trained model so that you can continuously improve it and be, make it either more general purpose or more precise if that's, uh, if that's what's desired. While classical deconvolution is certainly the gold standard for deconvolution today, uh, deep learning image restoration and more specifically deep learning image uh, deconvolution uh, holds a lot of... Um, opportunities uh, for uh, significantly improving on what has been possible before and circumventing several of the limitations of the classical deconvolution. So we're very excited to have this option already in Avia. Uh, and, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, what we have done and, and what it includes and how you can 
train a model yourself. We're using Arcan as a base, uh, a base model for our approach. Uh, the model was initially introduced by Zhang in 2018. And on the left-hand side, you can see a few images uh, that represent um, comparisons that they've done in, in their paper. So the top left picture labeled HR is, is the real image. Uh, and in their paper, actually, they're, they're looking or they're using this model to, um, to create super resolved images. It wasn't used for deconvolution. It was used for super resolution uh, imaging not in, 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 in life sciences. This is totally separate from life sciences. But that's what they used it for. And you can see here comparisons with many other approaches. And clearly their approach, which they call Arcan hours, is the best. And they have a long list of metrics, uh, including structure similarity index and uh, peak signal to noise and mm, several other parameters that calculate and compute the, the quality of the images versus ground truth. Uh, data and many other approaches that they've tested and and this one was by far the best so ARCAN stands for residual channel attention network and, and it was originally used to create super resolved images uh, for 2d this is a, a network that has more than 400 layers it's considered very deep network and our specific network uh, the one we developed or the one we created based on Arcan has over 1 million parameters which are autonomously optimized during the training process. In this type of network, there are several residual blocks with long skip connections. And this is technical speech for... Uh, it's, it's a way to basically remove or ignore uh, low frequency information while keeping the high frequency information uh, in the network and learned. So low frequency information would be noise and high frequency information would be uh, filaments or nuclei. So the things that don't appear that often on your image, if you look at the, the whole uh, field of view. So with this kind of approach, because there are these skip connections, uh, you can actually bypass the low frequency information while keeping the high frequency information uh, well learned within the network. Uh, in our hands, the model that we created based on this Arcan infrastructure takes about three hours to train using Avia Cloud uh, or 24 hours if you just use a single 1080 Ti uh, graphics board uh, locally. And we use the L1 loss function, which is a pretty standard uh, way to, to, to do these things. By the way, if you're interested in, in knowing a little bit more about deep learning for image analysis and image uh, restoration, the webinar that we did for Avia 8 uh, in November includes a lot more information and a, uh, and a good introduction uh, to the topic with some more background and references. So how do you actually train uh, or how did we train uh, a network? So in this case, the example I'll show today, we used 10 pairs uh, of, of images and, and one pair or one field of view will look a little bit like the one on the top left. And we did, or our collaborator created 10 images like that one from different regions within the sample. And each region was a, a 3D block, so 2K by 2K by 200. Uh, and we created pairs of images. In that same region, we imaged twice, uh, one uh, at very low quality, like the top image, and then at higher quality, the bottom image. And as I mentioned, it took about three hours to train using uh, Avia Cloud. So that's the ground truth on the bottom. Uh, that's the best image quality that we could get uh, on this particular setup. And this is using a Leica SP8 uh, with a, a resonance scanner. And the top image is using the same system, but instead of uh, imaging it uh, 64 times and doing an average and then deconvolving it, which is the ground truth on the bottom, uh, the top image, that's the input data for training, only has a single scan and, and uh, basically no averaging and, and no deconvolution. So ideally, 
for this application, the purpose is to dramatically cut down the number of hours it takes to image uh, a large sample. So if you can image all your samples using the setup uh, shown on the top left, which can be, very, can be done very, very quickly, you save a lot of hours uh, uh, of imaging time. Here is an example uh, of a larger field of view uh, of what the raw data looks like and what the ground truth data looks like. So raw data on the left-hand side is a single scan. Ground, data, ground truth data on the right-hand side is an average of 64 scans and then deconvolved. That's the best possible quality. Of course, we could do it without deconvolving. Then it will be slightly lower quality. Um, and that, So that's the ground truth. And this data is fed in pairs to our Arcan, modified Arcan architecture. Uh, and, and we can then run this on the cloud to train uh, our, our deconvolution uh, deep learning model. To apply, once we have the model, and I should say that takes three hours basically in the cloud, to the train process. To then apply this model, uh, you load an image like the one you have, or you create more images like the one on the top left and bottom left. Uh, that's a new raw data set. It has been imaged the same way as the uh, raw data on the previous slide. So just a single scan, uh, no averaging, no deconvolution. And then you apply the model, which is very quick, takes only a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds on a data set this size. And by doing that, uh, you can retrieve a very high quality image that is very, very similar uh, to the quality that you could get uh, if you had done 64 uh, scans and averaged that and then deconvolve it. You can see a, uh, a crop um, or expanded view of that yellow box on the bottom. So below each one of the larger areas, there is a, a box. So this, this box here is this inset here. Same thing here. And you can see the improvement in quality is, is quite dramatic. And that's what we can get uh, routinely now. This approach has huge benefits. We are all constrained, by, constrained when we're running experiments by our photon budget. Uh, and, and we have to trade off between these key, uh, key areas. So you can trade off spatial resolution for imaging depth or for temporal resolution, or, or, or uh, controlling the phototoxicity. Uh, but you cannot be close to uh, all of them at the same time. Uh, you can have a very high temporal resolution, but you cannot have, at the same time, very high spatial resolution. And it's very difficult, actually, to achieve both. Uh, you can have low photo phototoxicity, but then you're going to have pretty poor temporal resolution and pretty poor spatial resolution. Of course, ideally, you, you find a trade-off and you find a point that is acceptable for your experiment that is somewhere in the middle and you can bias it more towards one or the other of these um, uh, vertices on, uh, on this pyramid. But you can't have it all, basically. So you have to, to, to trade off uh, between these. With the approach that we're talking about, you're effectively increasing the budget, uh, the photon budget. Uh, and if we can look at it two ways. One, you can improve your current experiments by lowering uh, the phototoxicity because you can image faster uh, and still get the same quality images. You can also, because you can image faster, you even reduce the phototoxicity, or sorry, photo bleaching. And because you can image faster, you can increase significantly the temporal resolution of your, uh, of exp ex your experiments, which helps significantly with downstream image analysis. If you're doing uh, cell tracking or object tracking of any sort, it helps a lot if you have increased temporal resolution. So this is one way of looking at it, is, is uh, taking this technology, running the same experiments you run today, but just reaping the benefits of 
uh, uh, that come with uh, increased photon budget. The other way to look at it is to run experiments that you would not uh, normally run because they would become uh, useless, basically. They would damage the samples and, and you wouldn't be able to take um, make any reasonable um, uh, conclusions from the data. So you can significantly increase the temporal and or spatial resolution. You can significantly increase the length of the experiment. Um, that's particularly important because uh, you might be doing developmental biology studies where you normally wouldn't be able to image a sample for very long because it would become phototoxic, the experiment. Uh, or you can Im increase or improve the throughput. So you can image, uh, do the same experiment you were doing, but now image many, many more samples in the same amount of time uh, because you can afford to image them faster. So in effect, what we're doing is increasing that photon budget so that you can, uh, you can stay in the middle, basically. You can stay in the middle as before and have some sort of trade-off, but... Uh, your photon budget is greater. So you kind of have to actually expand the possibilities in all directions. You can get a little bit more spatial resolution and temporal resolution and image at depth with low to phototoxicity all at the same time. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a huge benefit. If you are into the management of a research group or a core microscopy facility, then increasing productivity uh, as well as reducing costs uh, is, is, is something that is very important. With this kind of technology, you can uh, certainly make better use of the systems that are already in place and get higher usage rates for systems that would otherwise uh, be less used because they produce lower quality images. And um, with this kind of approach, you can take those lower quality images and convert them into, into better quality images, sometimes as good as uh, what you would get on the, on the higher spec uh, confocal uh, microscope. Also, you can think about using this kind of technology to run experiments that you would normally not be able to run uh, without acquiring new hardware. So this way is a relatively cost-effective way to, to run additional experiments and expand the range of, of applications that can be covered by your research group or by your, your core facility. To train a deep learning model, you need a few pairs of images. I mentioned earlier 10 pairs, and here's an example of such a pair. Uh, this is the ground truth image, and here is the raw image of the input data. Uh, which is pretty much unusable, but very quick to acquire. So having the 10 pairs, you can then use Avia Cloud to very quickly train a deep learning model. We take care of all the hyperparameters, the model selection, the hardware, all the software that is required. We have all of that set up already. Uh, all you have to do is load your uh, training data sets and we'll create a deep learning model from that data, which you can then load to Avia and, lo and run locally. Uh, this is an example already loaded here, uh, but it essentially Avia Cloud creates an AC model, which you can load into Avia, and it, it just becomes a recipe that you can apply on any image. Um, of course, this model will work well with images that are similar to the, one, to the ones used for training. Um, so... Applying a model on the system that I have, which uses RTX 2080, takes about three and a half minutes. If you do it in the cloud, it's a few seconds, perhaps 20, 30 seconds or so. Um, however, I've done it locally because it's uh, more convenient and I'm just doing one image, so I don't have a lot to do. Uh, and I can show you here the result. So this is the ground truth. This is the result. And ground truth and result are very, very similar. Um, if you look at it in 2D, we can get a little bit better sense of what uh, the improvement is, and it's a, a dramatic improvement. So the input data looked like this. And the restored image looks like this, or the deconvolved image looks like this. And for comparison, we can load or show also the ground truth data 
which looks like that. So here's a small segment, and here it is the same small segment using uh, the, or looking at the, the, the deconvolved image. We can also look at this image uh, using the, the planner view, which sometimes is helpful to uh, inspect um, uh, the, the, the projections uh, that you can see in the image in a little bit more detail. So here is an example of a cross section. The ground truth looks like this. Uh, the input data or raw data looks like that, which is uh, extremely noisy. And the restoration, the deep learning restoration, the deep learning uh, deconvolution that we're, we have uh, done and applied here uh, will look like uh, this. So uh, very, very high quality, um, comparable to the ground truth and a huge improvement versus the image that was actually acquired in conclusion, AI deconvolution, specifically deep learning image deconvolution, offers you the possibility to run experiments that would otherwise be impossible or would be very difficult due to cost or availability of a particular system. This experiment that I shared the results with you here uh, was done in collaboration with Hu Zhao and his team at uh, Texas A&M here in the US. And we are open and we are collaborating with a number of researchers uh, worldwide, uh, testing out this kind of technology on a number of applications. So if you're interested in, in testing uh, your application uh, with us, we'd be happy to, to talk with you and, and discuss how we can go about uh, creating a model that works for your data. We do have already an uh, easy to train apply pipeline using Avia and Avia Cloud. Uh, Avia Cloud is by far the most efficient because it leverages very high powered uh, GPUs uh, on the cloud. And given that we don't really need a lot of training data, in this case, it was 20 data sets, 3D data sets. So altogether, it's probably what, three, four gigabytes worth of data, not more than that. So very small amount that can be easily uploaded uh, and run on the cloud, just a one-time thing uh, to train a model. And once you have a trained model, then you can apply that trained model locally. Uh, and, and that doesn't require you to upload anything. Uh, and it runs very, very quickly using a single GPU. Importantly, this model that is initially generated will be, uh, it will be possible, it is possible to continuously upgrade it with additional training data. And so you can gradually make your models more efficient uh, and, and more uh, high quality, uh, the output of the models more high quality, uh, increased high quality uh, as you process and acquire more data. And finally, and that's perhaps the most important, you can increase the productivity of your research group or of your core facility. Next, I'll be introducing the new functionality within the Neuron Composer, uh, which is the predictive tool, which are the predictive tools, uh, the clipping tools, and the follow tools uh, that help neuroscientists trace uh, with, within very large data sets that are cell dense. Uh, and that's quite a challenge. For more than a century, uh, the standard practice has been to manually trace neurons, literally, uh, manually trace them. And there are tools out there, commercial and open source, that still offer that today. And in many cases, that is the only way to get uh, accurate results. However, there has been quite a lot of tools developed and, and there are some successes uh, in, in this field. You can do a few publication searches and you'll find quite a few. However, the success uh, that we see in general is for either small data sets or data sets with a single cell uh, or with very sparse networks. And in those cases, 
uh, the automated, the fully automated uh, algorithms work uh, well. When we start to go to large data sets or very dense networks, then the automated algorithms, uh, a lot of them will struggle uh, with decisions about which dendrite belongs to which cell, for example. However, there are organized initiatives to benchmark uh, the, the quality and the accuracy of the algorithms that are currently in existence. The Big Neuron is one such initiative, and it's a very prolific one. Uh, more than 40, perhaps even more now, algorithms have been benchmarked, and, and you can look on their website. They have also a GitHub where you can find more, more information. We're using, uh, the base algorithm we're using is voxel scooping. And you can see the reference there from 2009. We've done a lot of modifications to this algorithm. The key reason we're using it is because it's extremely fast and very, very versatile. Um, we can then ap apply um, logic and empiric uh, reasoning uh, to get the best possible results. And that's what we've been focused on. This, this algorithm that at its core is very efficient and then optimizing it with our own uh, understanding of the, of the problem. So even though there's a lots, of, a, lots of advances in, in the last 20 years or so, uh, especially in the last five years, uh, many neuroscientists that we come in contact with still report major issues when looking at larger data sets uh, with denser networks. And this is becoming more and more frequent because uh, with techniques like Clarity and Pegasus and other techniques that clear the samples and systems like LightSheet where you can image extremely large samples, uh, then it is possible to create these, uh, these data sets um, in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of effort. So we feel like we have to develop uh, a set of functionality that helps these neuroscientists and helps this community get uh, more out of the huge effort that they make, uh, that you make, to create these data sets. So in Avia, we offer state-of-the-art automated neuron reconstruction, part of one of the recipes we have. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a fully integrated set of tools that are predictive and they are user guided. So there is some manual interaction, but it's very interactive and, and, and quick. So you can, in the more dense areas, uh, you, can, you can still get very good results. And you can use it, this, these tools can be used for both curation, so fixing things that aren't correct, or for just creating things from scratch. That's what the GUI looks like. And you can see there's quite a few options there. Uh, the camera mode and the clipping modes will help you uh, focus on the data of interest, the data that you can actually, that you want to work on. And the editing tools on the top include the predictive mode, which is new, uh, manual tracing mode that predicts or calculates the Z. Then you can connect, disconnect, add spines, and add SOMA. So there's quite a lot of functionality there. When you look at the, the predictive tools, we have two embedded modes. One is point to point, and the other one is a segment prediction. All of these actually, uh, all, all of the, the, the segments that you create automatically connect to one another uh, in an intelligent way. So it's uh, pretty efficient on how you, how you create your reconstructions. <coughs> Excuse me. So here is an illustration of the point to point. So the user adds one point at the start and then will move to a location where he wants to add the second point. When he clicks there, uh, it click creates a, uh, a, a segment. Um, even at long distances from one another, it still works reasonably well as you can see here. So this is a point to point. And in this case, you have full control of the tracing direction um, because you're defining the beginning and the end of that trace. With the other mode, uh, and, it, and, and they work seamlessly, so you can use one or the other at any moment. With the other mode, you click in a location 
and Avia will predict and propose a number of paths. And all you have to do is select the one you are interested in and Avia will validate that point and calculate another point or another trace in front of that. And you just run that process over and over again. The connections are done automatically. So if you click, as I've just done there, on a location uh, that already has a trace, and then you click somewhere far away from that point, then it automatically creates a branch in that location. You can, of course, uh, control that branch. If you, can, if you want, you can disconnect it or connect it to something else that's also available. But it does auto-connect for you uh, to save you a few additional uh, clicks. This tool offers a good trade-off between automation and control. In addition to all of the tools that I mentioned so far, there's quite a few additional, let's say, hidden or advanced options that you can use. So I invite you to come to the Neuron Composer uh, uh, page on the Avia Wiki and read more about it. You can also contact us, of course, uh, at avia support at drvision.com or just contact us through the demo request link and, and we'll help you explore uh, the Neural Composer using your data. Here's the demonstration of the new tools using the dataset that you just saw a moment ago. The tool itself is found under 3D Tools, uh, Neuron Composer, and then Predict Dendrite. To start using it, uh, zoom in into a region of interest, uh, adjust the dendrite or the, 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 the cursor size, and click. Um, AV is going to create a number of predictions which you can choose from. Uh, and, uh, and all you have to do is click on, on one of the yellow uh, predicted paths and Avia will validate it and then advance. There's a few modes that are useful uh, for, um, for, for tracing. Uh, the, one of the modes is, is related to, to how the camera behaves. If you use the pan only, it will not rotate the scene. It will just pan up and down as you're tracing and that's what i'll be using and then you have also latest grow and object set this is for clipping uh, currently it's set to latest and i will adjust in a moment to uh, grow and you will see the the difference uh, in latest it will just show the latest segment that was predicted whereas in grow it will grow the region of interest around uh, the trace that you're currently doing an object set so shows the whole cell that you're uh, tracing. Also very handy, you can adjust the clip size in case the prediction is a very small segment and you want to see around it. You can actually increase it a little bit and, and then it gets uh, larger. Uh, you can bring it down to one. So this is the smallest possible. And it's a small clipping area around uh, the predicted segments. So I'll start tracing now. Just validated that one and you saw the camera went down and yet again and now I'm getting to the end of this this dendrite so I can validate this last piece and then I hit B to build and that will finish this one segment. If I now use the grow it will actually show me the whole segment or object set uh, it does show all this, also the, the whole segment, plus a little bit more information. If I now continue tracing, I can uh, select a point on the data set and then uh, start again. If in doubt, I can hide the trace and it seems like I maybe traced too far. So I'm just going to adjust the, the lookup table here to make sure I didn't trace too far away. So it seems like there's still a dend right there. So I'm going to validate that and, and go back and continue tracing. Oops, I just clicked on the, on the data set. Continue tracing from somewhere else. So that's the that's the one we've done. So I can 
do perhaps this other branch on this side. And so far I've been using the segment prediction, but I can also do point to point where I'm essentially telling the software which, which direction to go. So it's beyond that uh, predicted trace. I'm clicking somewhere beyond that and it will try and identify uh, the path to the location that I provided. And here it does seem like we have a dendrite or a projection there. So I'm going to validate this and stop at this point. So I press B and that builds that one segment. You can also do it here for the other one and then validate that one. So um, with this tool, so now it's in latest or grow, with this tool, we can very quickly build uh, um, dendrite uh, segments or axons. Uh, in in reality, we can build the whole um, the whole uh, neuron can reconstruct reconstruct it uh, very very quickly in this way. Currently, the rendering is set <clears throat> is set to uh, ball and stick, uh, but we do have other ways to display it, uh, and they can be chosen here. So either as a line or as a mesh surface, uh, which is the, the closest one in terms of representation of the actual, actual structure. Once all the tracing is completed, either using automatic recipe or the predictive tools that I just showed, then uh, you can have access to all of these uh, wealth of measurements that we can calculate uh, from these, these object sets. If anything is missing, it might be turned off, so you can turn it back on. And if it's still missing, you can actually write your own measurements in uh, and, and it will run inside Avia. There's a couple of ways to look at the results. One is a spreadsheet, which you can export to Excel or somewhere else and also these uh, charts that are embedded in, in Avia. Here is a much larger data set. Uh, this data set was, uh, it's a Clarity data set created by Matt Wright and Ailey Crow from the Carl Disseroth lab at Stanford University. And uh, it has really long projections. So I'm gonna try and trace a few of these super long projections uh, and see how far we get with that. Um, I already have the tool turned on. So 3D Tools, Neuron Composer, and uh, Predict and Write are all turned on. And I've set my um, uh, mode to pan only because I don't want the camera to rotate. And I'll turn on also latest so that I'm, I'm seeing just the section that I'm interested in. And I'll get, uh, get going actually want to see a little bit more around the data set so that I can help uh, guide it, uh, not just validate what, what Avia is predicting, but also guide, guide this uh, tracing because it can be a little bit, it can be even faster. So this uh, way of hiding the data is, is great because you don't get bogged down by everything else that is around this particular uh, segment. Um, so you can do, do this. If you want to keep uh, vis visibility on the rest of the, uh, of the trace, you can and you use the, the grow mode. Uh, it's still better than, than sh showing everything. But the best or most restrictive is this mode where it just hides everything and, and shows only, only this portion that you really need. Now it seems like I made a mistake there. I'll come back to it and fix it in a moment, but I'll carry on uh, going forward. So here it seems like it's going this way. So I can use either the the predict the or the uh, predict the, the trace and then validate the trace, or I can do the point to point where where it's really useful if I need to jump a gap like like that one you saw over there. Okay. 
think we're still good. Is that correct? Yep, that looks that looks correct. Okay. So now I don't know anymore. Is it oh yeah, it's still still going this direction. So this is super long. Seems like we're getting to the soma right here. Okay, so that's complete, and uh, it is very long, as you can see, uh, and, uh, and 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 that is a complete trace for that super long uh, projection. Can display that projection there it is oh that's the place where I made that mistake so just to show you how to fix this is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, so using the sphere tool, you can disconnect uh, these two points, delete this last piece, and then either use the dendrite pencil, uh, so the, the, the manual tool that allows you to trace a small piece, and then you can use the connection tool oh did i just delete oh i did i think i deleted a piece that i didn't want to delete so i just did Control z to get back and now i can delete it Okay, that's done. So that's connected. You can see that it's now fixed. Okay, that's uh, another brief demonstration of the Neuron Composer on a large data set uh, tracing extremely long projection. In conclusion, the Neuron Composer and specifically the predictive tools that I just talked about are ideal for large, dense data sets. The example I have on the left-hand side was actually created using one of our standard automated recipes uh, where really all you have to do is put a few parameters and Avia will create the whole network for you. However, um, even in, in the fully automatic mode, uh, you may get 90% of the, the traces correct and then you still want to get that extra 5 or 10% uh, of accuracy, then you have a, a good tool in the, the predictive tools that we introduced today to go and, and do the curation uh, and, and fix those mistakes that are uh, perhaps there. You can also, of course, just create the whole network um, uh, using these predictive tools. It is very efficient and fast, as you saw, and because it's fully integrated, it's very easy to use uh, and you can very quickly move between tools and, and get uh, a focused on the data that you want to explore using our different camera modes and clipping modes to let you be um, uh, undistracted by uh, the, the rest of the, the data, which may be very, very large. The biggest data set we've tested uh, the predictive tools on was 1.4 terabytes in size, and it still behaved uh, well. In this next section, I'll be talking about big data rendering, specifically volume rendering. Uh, we introduced with Avia 6.0 uh, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, we introduced uh, the Avia TIFF file format, which is a multi-resolution, multi-block uh, uh, data format. It is based on the TIFF, so you can still open it on any software that can open TIFFs. It doesn't require a specialized uh, file reader. 
But if you're opening it inside Avia, then you benefit from this pyramidal structure. Uh, and, and, and that is a very powerful uh, type of technology that we have implemented more than a year and a half ago. With Avia 8.5, we're further raising the bar for what is possible with uh, large data sets. Pre previously, we had a limit of 60 blocks, uh, which already allowed us to render super large data sets. But we've raised that bar now to 3,000 blocks, actually more than 3,000 blocks, while sti still keeping quick rendering, uh, still much faster than, than video rate. We've also changed the logic uh, and the priority of which blocks are rendered when, uh, and that makes a big difference, uh, perhaps as big as having many, many more blocks, which allows you to have much bigger data sets. Uh, the logic of which blocks render first and, and at what quality, that has been re-engineered and it's now working even better, which is uh, great. So here we have purposely uh, slowed down the rendering of the blocks so that you can see them coming in. So if I play that again from the beginning, you will see there's initially very low rendering quality and then the quality increases. And we're also rendering uh, first the, the blocks in front and then the blocks in the back. Now I'm going to rotate the data set uh, in, a minute, in a moment and you will see it. So this data set was created on the CTLS uh, system from 3i. And it's a, it's a relatively small chunk. Uh, we're just using it here to illustrate the loading of the blocks. Uh, and this is part of a uh, kidney, a kidney sample. Here's another example. Uh, this is one of the training data sets from Hu Zhao. And you can see the blocks coming in and then the resolution increasing or the quality increasing. Uh, so the first blocks that come in are low resolution, and then if you let it uh, load a little bit longer, then you get the high resolution blocks. And here it's not slowed down, uh, and you can see the blocks load pretty much instantaneously, and it upsamples also instantaneously. Uh, this is a data set created by uh, Hu Zhao with a system from uh, CTLS, a system from 3i, the CTLS system. And it's a 4.1 by 4.5 by 1.1K. Uh, and it's a full mouse uh, brain. And you can see here, it says they're 38 uh, gigabytes. So not huge, but single cell resolution uh, and very smooth rendering. As you can see, uh, it has no problems dealing with this kind of data size. So slightly bigger or quite a lot bigger data set. This is 600 gigabytes in size. Uh, zero point, uh, actually, it's yeah, 0 0.6 terabytes in size. And this data set is a, a uh, sample. And the other sample is uh, Adam Glasser from the University of Washington and also Lightspeed. And the system is an OTLS. And they have uh, recently submitted and been accepted uh, to publish in Nature Communications. So it's in press currently. And this data set is 2K by 2K by 41K. So if I play that again for you. And it is single cell resolution. Uh, you can even, if you look at in detail, you can even see some, some uh, subcellular uh, information too. But it's definitely cellular resolution and is extremely large data set. There's two channels in this example, uh, but it's possible to image with more. This is an even bigger data set. It's 2.1 terabytes in size, 12K by 1.9 by 24K, by the same order as the previous um, uh, image, uh, but the sample is obviously not prostate, it's a lung sample. And here is the large data set that I showed you a moment ago in the presentation, um, created by Adam Glasser and the team at UW and uh, Lightspeed. It is uh, all just over two terabytes of memory required if it was loaded at full resolution. Uh, but because we have the multi-resolution, uh, multi-block uh, um, technology implemented, then we can uh, utilize a lot less memory 
uh, or make better use of the memory that we have available. I'm going to zoom in and you will see that the, the data set will update. Uh, it starts out with really low uh, rendering quality and then it improves gradually. Uh, and you can see the blocks coming in and out. The performance is actually can be even better than this uh, if uh, you're not doing additional heavy lifting on the video uh, on the GPU. And I, I currently I am. So I'm streaming and I have uh, screen sharing and so on uh, plugged into this computer right now. So it's not uh, optimal performance, but it is uh, it is pretty good already. And I thought it would be uh, nice to show you this data set uh, rendered in, in Avia. Now I'm going to load the uh, long uh, data set and pretty large. It's uh, 0 0.77 terabytes on disk. I'm just going to load it from disk right now. Uh, and it does take a moment to load, but it is a substantial data set. So that's expected. Of course, the better the hardware you have, the better it will perform uh, in, in Avia. So having fast SSD drives, uh, and, uh, and lots of memory does help a lot. Um, so here it's uh, uh, applied the, the 3D Neuron recipe, which is fully automated in the three regions separately. And that was important because the parameters that work well for this region don't work well for the region above or the region below. Um, and, and that's another reason for uh, using ROI uh, recipe apply so that you can have multiple regions and each region has its own parameters for analysis. We have quite a few other features. I'll just uh, show you a few more. Uh, this one is the, the live recipe apply. So in this, in this uh, new feature set, you can uh, point Avia to a folder that is going to be receiving files created by your microscope. Then you set up Avia uh, with the, the correct parameters so that it knows what kind of file will be landing in that folder. Uh, before you do this, you actually have to say which recipe you want to use. So you can see it's already preset. We're going to be doing cell tracking on a 2D image. And then you hit go. Uh, after you hit go, you hit go on your acquisition system. And the acquisition system is going to start acquiring files and placing them in that folder. Avia is going to pick them up, analyze them, display them, and create uh, charts for you. So this is cell tracking example. So you can see in blue are the files that were already generated and loaded into Avia. And soon we'll see a little bar, uh, horizontal bar appearing there, which shows which time points have been analyzed. And then once it gets enough files uh, to do the tracking, uh, that's dependent on the tracking parameters that you have, then it will start tracking and it will show you the, the results. So that's another handy tool. This works for 2D tracking uh, and all the 2D plus time applications that we have, like wound healing, exocytosis, calcium imaging, and a number of other uh, preset recipes that we, we offer. We've also developed a brand new tool set uh, for 2D stitching. That's what I'm showing here. Uh, it has quite a lot of functionality. Uh, I won't have time today to cover all of it in detail, but you can see the preview is uh, nearly instantaneous. So this is real time, just loaded 81 2D images in this case. So we loaded a load of them and they are being populated into this matrix that you see here. And you have a number of parameters that you can use to reorganize the data in the best possible way. You also can control the percent overlap uh, as well as um, uh, the blending modes that you want to use. So you can see here, you can uh, flip them horizontally, flip them vertically, uh, change the, the acquisition pattern. Uh, we have, I think, more than five, six, maybe seven or eight different patterns that you can use from spiral outwards, spiral inwards, raster in all the directions. Uh, there's really a lot of options there. And then uh, it uses a fast stitching algorithm to, to basically create a large uh, tiled uh, image. 
you can then continue and do all the analysis that you might want to do using that, uh, that image. Additionally, we've made very large uh, updates to the GUI. We have now so much functionality available in Avia that we felt the need to uh, offer you additional options for controlling your tool panels. We have four, at, at maximum is four. One that controls the display channels, so all the channels. Another one that controls all the objects that you've created, like neurons or cells. Uh, another one that controls the clipping planes, the ortho slicer, so basically the, the display settings. And then you also have all the tools, uh, like the 3D tools, the pixel classifier, uh, where the neuron composer is, and all, and all, and all that. Uh, so apologies for, for going very quickly on those last few uh, tools. Um, I do want to keep it brief, and I, and I know that if you're interested, you will get in touch and ask more questions. Um, so today, we covered in a little bit of detail uh, deep learning image deconvolution, and this increases significantly the throughput and offers you the possibility to run experiments that would otherwise be impossible. I've also shown you a little bit, uh, a, a teaser really, but an introduction to our neuron reconstruction tools, uh, the predictive neuron reconstruction tools that are user guided. Uh, we had already uh, tools that are fully automatic, but today I'm introducing the, the guided ones that help you trace in dense, large data sets. And then show you some examples of very large data sets that we can now render uh, interactively. Uh, the biggest one being 2.1 terabytes uh, in size. I did introduce very briefly a few other tools, the ROI preview and apply, the image stitching, the live recipe apply, the batch uh, pixel classifier wasn't actually discussed in detail, but you can look at our uh, Avia 8 um, uh, uh, webinar and, uh, and what we can do is now batch apply that pixel classifier that we pre-trained. And we've made some changes to the GUI that are significant. So before we finish, uh, I want to provide some uh, news and announcements. Uh, we are going to be at Elmi in June, also in Boston uh, at NALM. Then in, in later in June, we're going to be at a, a workshop in Charleston. And we're planning now our participation in the MBL uh, embryology and physiology courses that are taking place, will be taking place at Woods Hole. We're planning to be there between the 7th and the 15th, uh, but that's not confirmed yet. If you want to try Avia, go on our website and get uh, and go to the demo page and request the demo there. We'll get in touch straight away. Uh, and if you're a current user, you will get an email very, very shortly with a link so you can download Avia 8.5 today and start using it. In about a week, uh, I'll be running a web meeting for core facility managers, which will be um, a, 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 an introduction to deep learning, so a little bit more detail than what we talked about today. Uh, but the most important part isn't really the, the theoretical introduction. It's going to be about answering specific questions that uh, you may have about the technology, its application, uh, the limitations and the problems, and how to circumvent them. So you can, there is a list already on our website. You can see it, and you can vote on the questions that you want to be answered. You can also contribute new questions if you wish. Uh, and this is uh, primarily for core facility managers. So you're welcome to, to sign up and attend next week. And finally, I'd like to introduce to you, if you haven't met them already, three new team members, uh, Patrice uh, Mascalci from uh, uh, France. He's in France uh, and he's our representative in Europe. Uh, also, Trevor Lankin is uh, based in Texas and uh, covers the east side of the U.S., and Jim Palladino, who is our America's sales manager, and he primarily focuses on the West Coast, but has responsibility across, uh, across uh, the, the whole of the U.S. So this team is here to increase the support that you can get from VR Vision. You can continue to count on me, obviously, and contact me directly. 
as well as Queen Tran and Hoi and Lai, who are uh, directly in contact with a lot of you. And of course, you can continue to have access to our development team to try and solve your, your uh, hardest problems. I'd like to finish up by thanking uh, uh, everybody that uses Avia, all the users out there, everybody testing Avia for us and our collaborators for providing invaluable feedback uh, and, and ideas. Uh, and also the, the, the Avia team, and they're they are listed here, the, the current Avia team, plus the team that uh, has passed through the Arvision over the years and, and is no longer working here, but contr had contributions. Uh, so the current Avia team is uh, in the center, uh, and I'm very proud of this team. They're, they do a, a great job, and they're, they're really um, focused on creating a solution for the problems that a lot of us, uh, and I count myself in, in this group, a lot of us have uh, serious challenges, image analysis challenges that can't be solved by, by biologists. They have to be solved by uh, data scientists. Uh, and, and we try here at DR Vision to create this bridge between um, the, the applications and the problems that biologists and microscopists have and the know-how and the expertise with, with, uh, with algorithm development, software development, and data science to get those solutions uh, in good time. So uh, thank you very much to this expert team. Uh, I feel very uh, honored to work with it, with, with this team. And, and, I, and I look forward to continuing that and bringing to you even better versions of Avia in the future together with this, uh, with this great team. With that, I'd like to thank you all for participating and attending this web uh, webinar. Uh, I hope you found it useful and I'm going to be open for uh, taking some of your questions.